Hello everyone, I'm Aaron Pletz, and I'd like to talk to you about ACID transactions in Apache Cassandra. So, just what are ACID transactions? I mean, after all, this is something that if you've used Cassandra for a while, I mean, we've been doing pretty good without them. So, really, why would you want them? Well, ACID transactions are database operations which adhere to the characteristics of atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Essentially what that all means is that you have several operations that can be treated as a single unit of work and can be rolled back in case of a compartmentalized failure and no matter what, whether that, that transaction succeeds or fails, um, there will not be inconsistent data left over. Essentially, that's what it means. So let's look at this from a little bit of an example. Um, so how about how about a game transaction? So let's assume that we're playing, um, you know, one of our favorite board games, and we go ahead and we roll our dice, and our marker ends up on a property that we want to buy. So I'm going to go ahead and say yes, I'll take Augustine Drive for three hundred and fifty dollars and I'll go ahead and, and put my money out. And what'll happen is that if you've played this game before, you know that the, um, the realtor or the, the property person um, will then find this property for you and essentially exchange it for your money. But what happens if, you know, during that exchange, maybe our property gets lost somewhere along the way. So we hand the money over, but maybe the property gets knocked off the table. Or in Cassandra terms, Maybe we lose a cloud region, or we lose enough nodes that we can no longer get quorum. Um, so, so yeah, so there are some things that, uh, that need to be looked at here. So in this particular situation, how would ACID help with that? Well, so let's, let's look at what we want to do. We have three update statements here. So let's say that our player's name is Avery. He's the one who wants to buy that property. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to decrement Avery's cash by 350. We're going to increase the bank's cash by 350. And we're going to set Avery as the owner of the Augustine Drive property. So all of these things kind of need to happen as a unit or not at all. So the first thing we're going to do is, you know, syntactically speaking, we'll say, that we want to begin the transaction. Of course, we're going to want to get a current state of the player Avery, and specifically of his cash, because we want to make sure that he actually has 350 in cash before we decide to take it from him. Um, because, you know, in, in most games, they don't let you have negative values of cash. Um, and if that condition is met, then we go ahead and we run our update operations. And then finally, assuming that everything works out okay, we commit the transaction, and it happens, it's written, it's durable. Boom. Done. So, how does Apache Cassandra get there? Well, it gets there through something called a cord. As a part of Cassandra Enhancement Process number 15 for general purpose transactions, it introduces the Accord Timestamp Consensus Protocol which offers strict serializable isolation, usually one round trip, um, and it can operate over multiple keys. Essentially, this is the CEP that's going to put ACID in Cassandra. So Accord is a leaderless timestamp protocol, and it works because we have this thing on every node that's called a reorder buffer which is essentially a structure that helps us guarantee that one round trip consensus. Um, and it does so over something we call the fast path. Um, and with these fast path electorates, we can actually, actually have fault tolerance kind of like we do normally in Cassandra. Um, and there's also a slow path, but we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later too. And usually we can get this done in one round trip. So the, the nice thing about Accord is that it's leaderless, you know, it scales much like Cassandra does, and its failure modes tend to closely mirror Cassandra's failure modes as well. So it makes a great fit for uh, for what we're trying to do. 
So let's assume that we have a cluster with a replication factor of three. And it's an n node cluster. You know, maybe there are six nodes, maybe there's 12, maybe there's 120, um, re regardless. But um, essentially what we're gonna do is we're going to have um, one node function as a coordinator just like in, in almost every other Cassandra transaction or Cassandra operation, I should say. So one node will be the coordinator. Then there will also be additional nodes which will be part of the electorate. Um, the nodes that will actually like, you know, vote and decide whether or not this transaction is legit and can be completed. So here's a little bit about how the fast path looks. So let's say that we have our coordinator and we have our, our replicas that, that make up our electorate. Once the coordinator gets the transaction, it is going to propose a timestamp that this transaction could run at. It is going to send that timestamp out to the replicas and the replicas will check if they agree that this timestamp can be accepted. In an ideal situation, we get accepts from a quorum of our voting replicas um, that they accept that timestamp. It gets back, returned to the coordinator, and the coordinator goes ahead and executes the operations within the timestamp. However, maybe there's, there's a conflict um, in there with, with one or more operations happening on, on some of these voting replicas, and you don't get that quorum that comes back with an accept. Um, in this case, the replicas will return a new timestamp along with the list of uh, transactions that, um, that are conflicting. Um, and the idea here is then it'll go through the slow path of, of kind of figuring things out is where we're talking about making multiple trips to go ahead and make sure that this transaction makes it into Cassandra. So if we didn't have a cord, how would we do this? Well, I mean, there are ways. Um, you know, those of us who have used Cassandra for a long time, we have stories about trying to do this and other complex operations in code. Um, so really, bringing a cord, bringing ACID transactions into Cassandra really helps with that developer experience. Because the developer experience we want with Cassandra is when devs are writing their application and their applications on Cassandra, we want to make sure that we're giving them a feature-rich database to work with. Because what that's going to mean is that they're going to be able to write simple code to work with it. And simple code makes devs happy. And that's that's just the, uh, the way it works. So essentially, by putting Cassandra on ACID, we are drastically improving the developer experience as well as opening Cassandra up to a whole world of amazing use cases. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of Cassandra Fork. <laughs>